that is kind of illustrated by this diagram here. So when we first talked about complement, that's really what this is, is talking about in this uh, category over here. Um, this is really what involves a lot of soluble effector molecules and resonance uh, effector cells, but really just defensins and complement is what we're talking about for the first four hours. And then assuming that the pathogen is not uh, eliminated, that it survives that, then for the next four hours to four days, essentially we have a induced immune response, which is where it's not just complement and localized cells, but we're going to actually get into the process of recruiting stuff from the bloodstream to fight this infection and kind of giving it the full force of the innate immune system, which is kind of what we're going to talk about here. And then if that doesn't happen, uh, then uh, you will either you'll recruit the adaptive immune system, which is what this diagram here is showing, and uh, two things happen after the adaptive immune system is recruited. Well, really three things. The infection is cleared, you die, or you will be succumbed to chronic infections where this thing will essentially live inside you <laughs> forever. Um, Lyme disease would be a good example of this. But anyways. All right. So most cells are going to express an assortment of these things. There's a whole huge spectrum of them. Again, this pattern recognition receptor, if you're doing a concept map for this, that is what you're going to put at the very top of your screen or at the very top of your page for, for the map. Uh, and we're going to talk about all the different kinds of them. Um, this is something that's really important is the, this right here, distinguishing from self from non-self. How can we identify a pathogen and make sure that we're only killing the pathogen and that we're not killing our own cells. Okay, so phagocytic receptors. Um, mostly what we're talking about is macrophages, but to neutrophils also to a lesser extent. But um, what they're designed to do, so with macrophages especially, because they're in the tissues, we have those, those de deposited macrophages that are region specific. There's a specific macrophage that lives on my skin. There's a specific macrophage for my liver, whatever. They're usually the, the front line of the infection, and then they will recruit whoever needs to be there. So they're kind of, they kind of like to think of them as the Marines. They're the first to go in, and then they're probably, they arguably will never leave. And so they're poised to defend against intruding microbes that are either commensual or pathogenic. So, misconception time here, right? Just because you have healthy bacteria on your skin does not mean that if it were to get in your bloodstream, it wouldn't make you sick. So... Yes, those are both, uh, a commensual pathogen that's not where it's supposed to be can become pathogenic. Um, but for anything that really just isn't supposed to be there. Um, it works in tandem to promote phagocytosis and cytokine production release. That's predominantly what macrophages do. Recognizes ligands that are usually in high density on the microbial surface. Again, a pathogen-associated molecular patterns. We've already talked about this. So... This is just a, a broad overview of, of macrophages, but now let's talk about uh, something new, which is a C-type lectin receptor. And um, lectin, anything that is a lectin receptor, that just means that it is a protein that is designed to bind with sugars. The two types of phagocytic receptors, I'll just go ahead and draw this over here. Uh, I'll use a different color. This page has way too much white on it anyways. So clear up that. The ligands for these things... tend to be either a sugar or some part of a lipid. Now, it always contains either one of those. So for lectin is a protein that binds to, in this context, sugars. The mannose receptor would be an example of this. Uh, and what makes it unique is that the mannose receptor has eight CTLDs. And what the CTLD means is this is a lectin like uh, C type lectin binding domain and what that uh, so let's just talk about how C type the C here is because it uses a calcium ion CA2 plus to act as a cofactor to facilitate that binding between the ligand and the receptor itself um, so for mannose receptor that's you know if you just imagine that's a very large receptor it has eight of these binding domains and other type of domains that we won't even talk about. One of them is for like ricin, which I thought was interesting. But um, and then the other one is dectin one because it only has one. But as long as you understand that they're using calcium ions here to direct the interaction there, just as a cofactor to facilitate that binding. That's why it's called that. Okay. 
So the next type is scavenger receptors. And I know that I'm not a fan of PowerPoint slides either. I'm going to read these. We'll look at some pictures and then we'll do a map for review at the very end. But for uh, scavenger receptors, uh, they're, they're so called that because they scavenge you know, like pick at and re recycle, damage uh, LDL cholesterols from your blood, which is nice to have that. But there's two types of scavenger receptors. So, scavenge. Ah. There's two types of scavenger receptors. There's SRA and SRB. SRA is going to bind to the lipopolysaccharide of gram-negative bacteria. If you're ever asked to give an example of a conserved pathogen-associated molecular pattern, always give the lipopolysaccharide of gram-negative bacteria. That is the poster child <laughs> of pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Um, it also will bind to the tychoic acid of gram-positive type bacteria, whereas SRB only recognizes lipopeptides. So, again, keeping in mind that all this stuff here, and I, he didn't finish the word, lipotychoic acid is what it is, but usually a fat or a sugar. And then we also have macrophage receptors with collagenous structure. And the, the terminology that is used there is MARCO, but I don't understand how the words macrophage receptor with collagenous structure is an acronym for MARCO. Yeah, not, not even worth mentioning. But it recognizes both gram-positive and gram-negative. And the only other thing that I wanted to say about this is that this is very, very far away from your host cell from, from your cells extracellular membrane so here's your cell here and then Marco's way out here I always like to think of it like as a tower that's getting a very clear signal giving it off there so that you knows that it's one going to be able to bind to pathogens but two it's not going to be I guess um, kind of given off by this clutter of noises because the extracellular membrane is such a, a, a such a, a densely populated place, that and the cortex. Okay, so here's some pictures just kind of reiterating what I just said. Um, we also didn't consider this, but also under the lectin thing are complement receptors, CR3 and CR4, which from last chapter we had talked about how that binds to the IC3 uh, beta. This is the inactive cleaved form of the C3 convertase, but it also recognizes a crap ton of C-type lectin domains. Just to give you some examples, um, it binds to the Leishmania, which I don't know if you've ever heard of Leishmania brasiliensis, but um, you'll see pictures of that, and it's like the the infection versus the face, and the infection wins. So it's very nice that we have at least some means of identifying that. Um, some other examples would be Candidia, uh, Histoplasmosa, or Histoplasma, sorry, like uh, Spelunker's lung, I guess, is fungal infections, um, Bertussis, uh, all kinds of every single thing that you can imagine. Um, very well, a very wide range of, of substrates for that receptor binding here. So anyways, this is just showing you a picture of the mannose receptor and all the different types of C-type lectin domains and then these R-type lectin domains that are kind of exemplified here in blue. We didn't really talk about those, but we call those R-type lectin domain just because it shares a similar binding domain with ricin and uh, if you ever know anything about ricin, I hope that you don't. I think it's actually an episode of Breaking Bad where you poison someone with ricin, but it it was inaccurate because uh, if you're poisoned with ricin, you would die immediately. It inhibits your ribosomes, but and that's not important. Uh, it's just the receptor agent that we have for the mannose receptor, showing you how just how large it is. And here we see the dectin-1 with just one C-type uh, binding domain. This would be a complement receptor. They're not being specific and showing you the difference. CR3 and CR4 both bind to the same thing, so they probably have very similar structures. And this is the SRA attached at the very end of the MARCO, but MARCO itself also has um, its own unique little binding sites for everything. And then SRB as well. So also we can have, you know, receptor mediated phagocytosis, which again, like I talked about earlier, that increases your concentration of reactants, which will increase your concentration of products, which makes the kinetics, the reaction goes faster. Our screen we have at the very beginning of our map, we have pattern recognition receptors. And an example of a pattern recognition receptor would be a phagocytic receptor. All right. So for the categories of phagocytic receptors, and there's really um, only two real actual categories that we have here. 
that consists of the the lectins, which is a very very large category there, and then the other one is the is that gold? Yes, that's gold. <laughs> the scavenger receptor. For the classifications of lectins, we have just uh, I guess as an example of this, the C-type lectins, and then the subcategory of or a branching category of lectins would be the complement receptors. For the C-type lectins, remember these are lectins that use calcium as a, something that facilitates the calcium in the ionic in the cationic form to facilitate the binding of um, the ligand with the receptor. The ones that you need to know are the mannose receptor, dectin is another example that they give, or dectin one if you want to be specific here. And then it's not listed in that last PowerPoint slide, but something called Man and yes, it is different from the mannose receptor, although they're very similar. It's called mannose binding lectin. And when we start talking, or in the last video that I made, where I talked about the lectin pathway of complement activation, that's where you're getting this. It's a C-type lectin as, as well. Um, so uh, well, let's just kind of divulge in. For the mannose receptor, you need to know that it's very, very large. It has uh, eight C-type lectin domains, and then it has two R-type, but you don't need to really know the R-type because that doesn't really, it's named after something, but the book doesn't really go into much details on the structures behind it and the functions of it. And then for Dectin-1, it only has one C-type lectin domain. For the complement receptors, the only ones that we need to know would be complement receptor 3, and complement receptor 4. Not every complement receptor is under this category. And I'm just going to go ahead and branch these two together as one subpart. Yeah, they're, they're separate receptors, but they're both structurally really related, then they're both functionally really closely related. And if you notice in that back diagram that we showed a picture of it, it didn't even bother making the distinction between the two. So I'm just going to write that they recognize a lot. I'm not going to write out all the things that they recognize they recognize a lot of pathogen associated molecular patterns. They also undergo receptor mediated phagocytosis not with pathogen associated molecular patterns but with the inactive form of C3 convertase from the last chapter there. That's why it's important that our cells further degrade that down. And then the thing that we didn't, I don't think it was listed, but I'm going to go ahead and just mention it anyway, is that these also act, they're not just as complement receptors for receptor-mediated phagocytosis, they act as integrins. So what do integrins do? Well, integrins, their main job is, is to function in communication, so cellular communication. Kind of hard to read that, I know. But the way that they do this is by acting as... Uh, cellular adhesion proteins as well, which we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, the roles that they can each play in that. So that's, that's pretty much it for the huge category of the lectin family. Now let's move over to scavenger receptors. And so for scavenger receptors, there is scavenger receptor B, and I will just only thing I'm going to list under there that we need to know about that is that it binds to lipopeptides. There is scavenger receptor A, and this thing binds to three things as well. At least hopefully this can fit. I'm just going to say the names as I write them so that you can know um, exactly what it is I'm talking about. But the lipopolysaccharides of gram-negative bacteria the lipotychoic acids of gram-positive bacteria, and then any type of CG-rich DNA, which is a common feature, structural feature, of pathogenic uh, microorganisms. Okay, so the other type of scavenger receptor, I don't know why I didn't mention in this, because I didn't feel like it gave much details to the mechanism, but yes, you do need to know that they scavenge uh, low-density lipoproteins from the blood. So, the other one would be, I'm just going to call it MARCO. I don't like the acronym because it's not an acronym. It doesn't, <laughs> it's not letter per letter. But anyways, 
So what you need to know about Marco is that it has its own it has its own pattern recognition receptors. It contains SRA at the very end of it, and it is made out of a I'm going to call it a collagen-ish, meaning it's not collagen, but it's really similar to collagen-ish triple helix, and it holds things far away from the cell, uh, from the extracellular membrane, and so by keeping things away from the cell surface, you get a really good, clear signal. Um, its binding is going to be easily facilitated, and it's less, if your arms are figured, think about it, if I have my arms further out, well, and I start walking around like this, I know it's kind of goofy to think about, I'm more likely to bump into stuff. It increases the collisions of, or I guess you can think of it as the binding, I don't know why I'm keeping thinking of collision theory here, but it increases the binding of uh, the pathogen-associated molecular patterns with their pathogen recognition receptors. So, that's it for that. Let's move on.